So now we go live. Good morning and good afternoon. And good evening if our you know, spectators, or our participants will join us from these parts of the world where there is deep evening at the moment. My name is Maxim Kislev and I'm very honored to run our session on uh, developing emotional and cultural intelligence during the pandemic. So we'll just make a very brief introduction to our session and then we'll start the, the discussion and I will be addressing each of you with the questions on that matter. Uh, I'm a psychologist, so whatever I've been doing for over the past, let's say, almost 35 years, it was somehow about all matters of relating with people, with psychology, and I was very fortunate to uh, start my studies of emotional intelligence at Yale many, many, many years ago, but uh, with those who initially, so to say, like introduced our current understanding of the concept, I mean, Peter Salloway, David Caruso, John Meyer, well, those people who originated somehow this line of studies. But in any case, uh, I do, uh, so to say, practice in terms of education as well as in terms of applying in life, of course, or whatever I know about emotional intelligence. And mm, I realized over the past, let's say, decade that the concept itself became, you know, not just uh, very important. Well, obviously it is, uh, as all of the studies would show, right, that our life success might largely depend on what level of emotional intelligence uh, we may have. But, um, you know, like in application to all of the spheres of our life, to business, to, you know, building relationships with the people in any kind of organization. And here I just bridge it with what we are experiencing now, because uh, I, I think that you would agree with me that, you know, at the moment, uh, like in the other times of the crisis, but this crisis is very special because it is global in full sense of this word. Well, this is in fact emotional intelligence that either might help us tremendously in really coping with a lot of challenges that this crisis is bringing about. Here, well, in addition to that, well, emotional intelligence, of course, is about empathy and compassion. It is about being open and able to understand other people's feelings and experiences. And so to that end, in the time of the pandemic, well, we certainly, so to say, apply to the full extent uh, our ability to uh, exercise, if you wish, emotional intelligence. As a framework, yes, as you know, as, as lots of our competences that are embedded. And cultural intelligence, uh, I think, is very keen to that. I will explain my understanding and then I will probably ask you to start with your understanding of both of the things. Because cultural intelligence is about this ability to understand and be very open as well as to be accepting features that are very different of your own. So to stay away from what we know in social sciences as ethnocentrism or cultural centrism and to understand that the whole of the world is one community. And within this community, we have such a tremendous diversity of cultures, which is, by the way, the great treasure of our world, right? But at the time of the pandemic, well, certainly uh, this is a particular call to be even probably more open, more understanding, and more accepting, rather than in what we can call the peaceful times. 
the times before the crisis. So this is in the exposition. This is something what we are going to uh, talk about. And probably uh, I will start just with your, so to say, um, vision of both of the concepts of emotional intelligence as well as cultural intelligence as they apply to our life situation right now on our small and beautiful planet. So maybe uh, why don't we start with, with Carolyn? And if I uh, may, I will uh, introduce you then, because this is my privilege, you know, like being a moderator. Carolyn Marlowe co-founder of Imaginal Labs, and uh, I can only add that Carolyn has tremendous experience in running organizations, in, in being a leader, as well as developing leaders. So, Carolyn, well, we start with you. Thank you, Maxime. It's really wonderful to be here, and I love the topic of emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence. So I want to just say that what links these two is the word courage. Um, courage comes from the word heart, and it means to go forward with your heart in your mouth at times of doubt, fear, and uncertainty. And certainly we are in that place. Um, and the amazing thing about the pandemic is that we're all in the same place at the same time, experiencing the same thing, regardless of culture boundaries or backgrounds. So that creates the conditions for empathy. Uh, and the, the opportunity here around cultural intelligence and emotional intelligence to be able to feel what the other person is feeling and feel what you are feeling gives us an opportunity to move from uh, group think to group genius because traditional boundaries of culture and tribe have us more focus on what what someone who I already know thinks and feels. Um, the opportunity to bridge that, this cultural intelligence, allows us to actually move to group genius, uh, which is so different. And I'll just say one other thing about that. You know, here we are in this kind of technology, being able to communicate with each other. But frankly, the greatest technology that we have on the planet uh, are human beings' desire to connect and to solve problems together. That's the group genius. So we can really rely on that technology to be able to um, uh, create these bridges um, that will really unite us at this critical decade uh, in the world. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. This is very, I would say, like touchy what you've said, and uh, it's very, very uh, compatible or uh, matching well with what I started with, like, like when we start thinking and feeling beyond the boundaries of the countries, and of the cultures mm -hmm. facing this global threat and the global challenge, in this case, the pandemic. I'm just thinking just a year ago, could we think of something like, like COVID-19? I mean, uh, we felt as the humankind, we felt so safe and we felt probably so quiet and confident and all of a sudden, which shows this fragility of the world we live in and makes us think of how we can save the world and what we have in the world together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, Liz, let's turn to your understanding of these things in emotional and cultural intelligence and how they are now 
challenged by the pandemic. Thank you. I appreciate that. I have, I have to introduce you before that. Elizabeth Markle, Dr. Markle, Executive Director and Founder, Open Source Wellness from California, United States. Yeah. Thank you. It's oh, very yeah. dark. It's very <laughs> dark and very early here, but thrilled to be here. And thanks for the, the question. Yeah, so I think there are two things I want to highlight about emotional and cultural intelligence, which is that both have an interpersonal component. How do we relate to each other across person? And how and both have an intrapersonal component within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we typically focus on the interpersonal, which is great. And questions like who are you and how do you work in there come to the come to the forefront. I, I come from work in healthcare. I'm also a psychologist and work with big healthcare corporations. And um, part of what we try so hard is to help providers make the shift in their thinking from what's the matter with you, right? Why don't you eat better? Why do you do these cultural practices that you do? What's wrong with you to what matters to you? Because clearly it's not what doctors are saying. It's not even what therapists are saying. There's innate value in what matters to people that gives you far more traction and power in intervening than the question of what's the matter with you. So I think that lands for me as a key anchor in our shift around emotional and, and cultural intelligence. And then when we look at the intrapersonal aspects yep. of emotional and cultural intelligence, it's the same questions turned inwards. Who am I, right? What makes me tick? Why do I do and feel and say the things that I do? And and similarly, that question of, of pivoting from what's the matter with me to what what does actually matter to me, I think is key. And one of the things that we've come to understand in our work with open source wellness is that as water is to one's body, sort of universally beneficial, compassion is to one's psyche. And it's I, I would say it's like the original regenerative resource in that when you give it, it doesn't deplete, you actually create more of it. And that the, the experience of extending compassion to another or to oneself, it transforms suffering from this compacted, where there's suffering and then there's suffering about suffering and then there's suffering about the suffering about the suffering. It liberates that whole thing for generativity and kindness and, and generosity to be present towards oneself and towards others. So. So much to say. I will pause there and, and thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's so much uh, to listen and think about that now I start very actively be pity about the shortness of our session. <laughs> we also, you know, this. well, we, we are the colleagues in full sense. So I, I bet that probably we, we'll be able to continue beyond some time. Well, now, Scott, to you and your understanding, Carol, I'm very happy to introduce Scott Mardell, who is the CEO of the uh, global organization, the YPO, well, that helped tremendously to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, right? As far as I remember, it's about 30,000 of the members of the organization at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. In all countries of the world. But anyway, briefly about your understanding of emotional and cultural intelligence and this particular challenge that we are experiencing now with the COVID. Thank you very much. And it's great to be here with everybody. I'm enjoying this topic uh, so much because it's at the root of our humanity and, and, and how, how we grow as a people and as individuals. With that, I, I can really maybe articulate slightly differently than a couple of the comments we have, but mostly in a complimentary way. Um, first of all, uh, we live our life in assumptions, okay? Um, sometimes they're conscious and sometimes they're not. And when we act in assumptions, we're pretty much acting from a frame because we're trying to do something and trying to work with through somebody, basically, as opposed to with somebody. But we have assumptions. We all do. Uh, and some, some people call them biases when they want to put a negative side to that. But it, the fact is we all live in, in assumptions and stereotypes and whatever words you would like to use. The interesting thing about cultural and emotional intelligence is actually the humility to check that, 
Okay. And so it, it, it's part uh, compassion, but there's got to be humility, just a sense that I'm just one person. Okay. And, and am I humble enough to, to really recheck my, myself relative to how I'm interacting in the world? And this is where the awareness part kicks in. Cause, cause definitely if I'm aware that I have some assumptions, I may have some different understandings. If I'm aware that I need to understand better, then then all of a sudden I'm beginning to solve the challenge about creating my own personal uh, emotional and cultural intelligence. The road to both are actually quite similar in my view in that you need to be open, listen more than you process and really begin to just recognize that if I'm interacting as somebody who grew up in the United States with somebody from another country and another culture, uh, I need to be very open to the cues and, and is, and is um open and, and, and communicative relative to what I understand and don't understand. People respond to that incredibly well as, as that would go. In this pandemic, strangely enough, I think we've actually created more room for cultural and emotional intelligence. Uh, people have more time. Many people aren't traveling the same way that they were. Um, the busyness of some parts of the previous life are now gone. There's a lot more self-reflection happening. And a, in a group like YPO, we're in 140 countries and we're, we're connected in a borderless way. And this session, this conference is an exact example of that relative to the fact that we can connect culturally in many different ways. The tactics of doing that are quite a bit different. Uh, and, and that's a whole different conversation. And I'll, I'll, I won't go into that because I don't want to take everybody's time. But at the same time, I, I do believe that the humility to know that uh, um, I don't have it figured out, that I need to get past uh, my, my points of view and actually be very open to other points of view. And that awareness alone and, and be intentional about how I handle that awareness ultimately is the road to both. So um, so hope that helps. And I'll, I'll pause here as well so I could go on. Well, thank you, Scott. Yeah, that's that's also most interesting and valuable uh, remarks that you've made on that. And, you know, uh, I'm thinking about the format that we have now. Yes, we cannot now uh, meet offline at the moment, right? And even like Harassis, uh, that I'm proud to go for many years now, uh, well, could not have happened in offline format. And thanks to the technologies, we can do that online. But what I'm thinking about, and uh, as I was listening to many sessions before our session uh, this afternoon, most afternoon, <laughs> then uh, uh, we are all speaking about pretty much similar thing. That on the other hand, as you said, Scott, any crisis is both the threat and opportunities. And of course, in this case, in the case of the pandemic, we see uh, that this is a great for us to unite and for, for us to actually become, I totally agree with that, to become more emotionally and culturally intelligent. Understanding that we are all, no matter which country we are in at the moment, and no matter what culture we belong to, that all of us, we are actually, you know, our parts of, of the united world and the global world and the global community. So our session also is a good illustration to that because uh, we have, uh, I'm in Russia and uh, actually I live in Russia. Though I work in the international institutions, well, Skolkov Institute of Science and Technology, we have students from 45 countries of the world. And somehow it was the partnership between Russia and the United States and specifically with MIT, how this whole thing was founded and how it appeared. Well, I, I see also that one of our speakers, uh, Long, is actually uh, with us on the chat, but unfortunately not in the room. So uh, hopefully... At some point, his connection would allow to join. But again, well, even in our small session, we are from at least four different cultures and four uh, countries, well, five countries, actually. Well, uh, Donia is supposed to join us from China. Well, I don't know what happened with his connection. In any case, uh, in the ground or in this, in this foundation, 
of uh, unity, we do have this this sort of mm, emotional and cultural openness, first of all. And uh, I believe that another important word to that, in order, by the way, uh, to fight the stereotypes or to overcome the stereotypes and to overcome many of the things uh, that separate cultures and people. Well, uh, right now we have this understanding that we are facing the global challenge, the challenge of pandemic. Okay, now I will go if you uh, don't mind. Well, unfortunately, it so happens that neither Donny nor Long can be in the room with us. So, but hopefully, uh, they will fix something while we are still on. Uh, now, let's go to a little bit more specific things uh, as they apply to what you do. And as they apply closer to your experience and uh, your contribution, in fact, to the development of both things, of emotional intelligence as well as of cultural intelligence, uh, in your practice. Because, you know, the hands-on experience, what can be more valuable rather than hands-on experience? So, Caroline, again, maybe I will start with you, if you don't mind. And uh, I will probably ask you, because you have this Tremendous. Oh, hi. Hi, Long, finally. <laughs> finally. <laughs> oh, and, and we hear you, finally. <laughs> so, did you happen to hear what we were talking about before? Yes. Um, I hear, uh, yeah, I listened some of your discussion. Um, maybe I share you, something. Yeah. Maybe yeah. if you don't mind, I will, I will address the same question that I address to everyone like your understanding of emotional and cultural intelligence and uh, what's going on with that right now under the pandemic, under these circumstances of the threat, uh, the global global challenge that we have with COVID-19. Yeah. Um, firstly, I totally share with people here. So my part of view is maybe a little bit more like industrial person, more than academic person. But I think um, I totally share with people that the emotional and cultural uh, intelligence uh, will grow uh, quickly in, in the future and uh, become more and more important. And, you know, in the situation here, uh, as a uh, the person who work in industry, uh, I really feel that the COVID-19 impacts strongly in people. And as um, Scott already said that, People usually live in assumption, and now the assumption sometimes is broken, right? And it's a moment people rethink about the value of life. Uh, I have a friend, she worked very hardly for a big company here in Vietnam. Uh, she is a top manager, um, and she can, you can say that she's a very successful social uh, lady uh, in, in, in society. Um, and during the COVID, she need to take the quarantine, you know, social quarantine like everyone. And she has more time to to hang out with uh, her children and also, uh, you know, really uh, refresh the family and take time to uh, cook at home, etc. And she review the, the life and she said, that, OK, what is the real happiness of life? And uh, sometimes we talk each other by, by phone. And she said, wow, I really miss uh, the feeling contacting with people. And I said, no, no, we are talking by phone or, or you know, even like this. She said, okay, but she really wants to contact with people, you know, uh, physically. It's not uh, the phone or the um, any kind of technology cannot uh, replace. So that is a reality. Um, people review what is the value of life. And the second thing uh, I think is also very important is the digitalization is what we have today. So the EI or the CI will slightly change. It's growing, but also slightly change. Uh, the, the way people work, uh, talk and interact through internet 
is very uh, common now. So uh, it's also they have to uh, find a new uh, behavior, the new uh, method to contact with people through uh, internet. And uh, you know, you even manage and impact influence on people through internet. It's different uh, with the co uh, directly contact. And I see it's also a very nice thing. Uh, it can uh, impact strongly on the way people, uh, on the leadership and management, leadership through internet. So of course, EI or CI will also strongly impact it. It's my part of view. Well, thank you, Long, thank you. Yes, uh, you said one of the things that uh, is probably uh, one of the key things that's, that's happening, that we are now, you mentioned this word, reviewing, and we are truly reviewing or probably even reconsidering lots of the things that we were so used to, but right now we have to see at the same things at the very different angle due to the situation. Okay, thank you. Now, I want to address, uh, as I said, my question uh, closer to your experiences. And, and Carolyn, uh, I will start with you here. Uh, I know that uh, you've been working for that many years with, with leaders of various kinds uh, in business and public organizations. Uh, and uh, you are helping them, in fact, to resolve this weak problem. What are these weak problems and uh, what is the role of emotional intelligence in finding the solutions for that? Well, the, the, a wicked problem is something that you can't look to history to resolve. You can't analyze anything. A wicked problem is something that is so complex, not complicated. Complicated, you can look to history but it's complex and emergent and requires multiple stakeholders with different points of view to come together to design a new approach. Now, to be able to do that, you need to create conditions for the real human beings to show up. Because to collaborate, which means to co-labor, it means to be able to bridge differences, to put new ideas into play, to play with those ideas, and then to turn hope into action. So think about that. Put ideas into play, play with ideas, and then of all the ideas that we could do, allowing everyone to have their say, allow the group genius to decide the way in order to put hope into action. So to do that, you need not only IQ, intellectual intelligence, yeah. emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence, and I will then throw out another intelligence, what I call OQ, organizational intelligence. So not only to understand how you think and feel, how someone else thinks and feels, but to be able to hold how does the organization think and feel about uh, a problem, a wicked problem, and how do you create the psychological safety of a brave space, not a safe space, but a brave space, because what we now know is the world isn't safe. To be able to truly be vulnerable, you need a brave space uh, where you can, um, where it's okay to share what you are most concerned about. Yeah. So right now, just to bring this back to the pandemic, we are really in a wicked problem. Yeah. And there is no history that can analyze um, to come up with the answer and you don't have the answer and you don't have the answer and you don't have the answer. But together, we might come up with a new approach that allows us to let go of all the old stories, uh, to let go of the current way power and privilege gets distributed and to really be 
on a horizontal peer relationship with each other. Because that is the only way wicked problems get solved. And when they do, magic happens. And magic happens only when we are heart to heart. Well, uh, I couldn't agree with that more. <laughs> you know, and, uh, again, emotional intelligence uh, is one of the things that I embed even as a framework in my courses for the Skoltech students. Well, right now I'm teaching the course which is called Leadership for Innovators because Skoltech is about innovations and around innovations. And uh, from the very beginning, I placed uh, emotional intelligence as the framework for what they can develop as leadership. And first of all, emotional leadership of nowadays, right? Or if we speak about, you know, solving the problems of the leaders, to that end, I will now get to, to Scott, because you, your peer-to-peer -peer organization, in fact, well, the, the methodology of peer-to-peer, -peer, for that many years, how old is YPO? I think about 70-year-old, something like that? Yes, yeah. we, yes, we have Se 70 years, um, and, I, and I love what Carolyn just shared. And I always like to step out of a situation uh, to look at it, to understand where, where we set. And, and so stepping way back, uh, um, there's been 102 billion people on this planet before the people who are here now. OK, 102 billion. And right now we're seven and a half. And when we think about all of the problems that those societies and those people have solved, it's ultimately been through an incredible amount of humanity and difficult situations and doing that co-labor, that collaboration that Carolyn was, was referring to is, is really what it takes. And so YPO um, is not a curriculum. It's a peer-to-peer -peer learning. And, it, and it's uh, um, we are a whole person organization, being the fact that leadership isn't about price theory, okay? Leadership is about uh, um, motivating others, having a vision, working together for common purpose and cause and, and finding value in self and value and collective effort uh, to do that. And so looking back into history and looking back to the present, how do we learn? We learn from each other and, and we need to create an environment where we can be vulnerable, we, we can be curious, and we can hear stories from other people about how they have addressed something that might be kind of the same, but maybe different. And then we can decide for ourselves really what's best for what we're working our way through. And that's what YPO has been doing since 1950. And, and so um, before there was actually business education and everything else, I mean, you had the Ivies, but that was really it. And, and the, the business training, the business education model was peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. So we're continuing that. We're very committed to it. And it's wonderful to see curious people, people with goodwill, people who want to make a difference people who know they're not perfect, people who know that they've got blind sides and, and would somebody point them out to them. And it's uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's it's very, very motivating. So YPO's role in all of this is a tiny slice. We work with the leaders, not with their companies. Um, the leaders really work with themselves and uh, they make some good decisions and they actions. And that ripples through their companies, through their societies, through their communities, and through their families. And so all of us need people we can talk to um, and who will be honest with us, who will, who will really, really press us. And that peer-to-peer -peer area is really one of the key elements to how, how this can fit together. Well, thank you, Scott. Thank you. And now I will turn probably to Liz because, uh, you know, Liz, you mentioned this, uh, so to say, Double facet reality, which is uh, interpersonal and intrapersonal, which is about each of us and which is about relationships between all of the people. And uh, you write and speak about uh, community as medicine. This is a very intriguing concept, and I know little about that, frankly. So why don't you explain a little bit more how community works in that sense as medicine, please. Sure, yeah, thank you. So I think we know biologically and psychologically that human beings are wired for connection, right? In isolation, we don't do well. And, and part of what's happened with the pandemic is profound, profound isolation. 
At least in America, we know that 64% of, of adults are depressed or anxious or both. And they all point to the loss of default social structures that met people's needs for connectivity without willpower and without wealth at the gym, at work, at church, with their friends and family, people's needs for social nourishment were being met and now they aren't being met in the same ways. So part of what we do at Open Source Wellness is do our best to design in four basic pillars of human thriving. We say move, nourish, connect, be. So physical activity, healthy food, social connection, and stress reduction. And with all respect to our work, none of that is rocket science, right? It's not like, what a radical idea. But I think what we know is that successful societies across cultures, across history, have baked these practices into the fabric of society. So you didn't have to think about it. Oh my God, how am I gonna connect with another human being? How am I gonna manage stress? How am I gonna get some physical movement? It was, it was woven into the fabric of our daily realities. And that is, I think, what we have lost in this pandemic and, and lost before that. So our work at Open Source Wellness, yes, it's linked to healthcare so that we have a systems-based delivery, but really what we are delivering is community as medicine. We're usually using intentional community, not default community, or let's see what's on my Facebook feed community, but the intentional design of social structures such that people's needs are met, such that we can generate physical and psychological health at the population level. So thanks for asking. I could talk all day about community as medicine because I think right alongside food as medicine and exercise as medicine, we need the experience of belonging and meaning and purpose. So thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's, it's uh, by the way, well, it, it is very keen to my long time ago experience because I started in practice of psychology. I started in psychosomatics. So I was studying these particular effects of connection between uh, our experiences and our feelings as well as relationships and how they are reflected in our bodily diseases somehow. Mm -hmm. So, and, and certainly I, I, at that time, that was long ago, as I said, at that time, nobody would approach that as community as medicine. But certainly we have psychosomatic approach for a couple thousand years already as the family, as relationships with the other people, as the more general social environment, of course. Now, Long, I would like to ask you, because, you know, like uh, we started with this uh, various views of various from various perspectives on what's going on with COVID and reality with COVID. But I know that Vietnam is very successful in fight in fighting the pandemic. Well, may I ask you, what do you think is the role of this emotional and cultural intelligence in your success to that end, and how these relationships between the people? might help also to be effective against the virus. Yes. Um, firstly, um, I can share with you that uh, in Vietnam now we have uh, about more, uh, uh, today we have a zero new case of COVID. And, this is, uh, yes. Yeah, almost no okay. COVID in our country anymore. Um, and uh, we, uh, we have... Uh, totally from the beginning until now, it's just more than 1,000 cases. And most of the case is from foreign, uh, uh, they come from abroad. Uh, um, very few cases from the community. Because at the beginning, well, you know that we are a country beside China. And at the beginning, when we observe the situation of Wuhan in China, we understand immediately the problem that if it's really impact strongly in Vietnam, we have uh, no possibility to uh, control the situation. So that's why we make a very strong decision that we have to stop everything at the beginning. Uh, so we, we do something very strongly and we, we make a communication with people. And we, uh, it's very nice thing in our government, they try to compare the uh, COVID with the enemy. And you know, in our story, in our history, um, we have a long history of uh, count, uh, against um, 
external uh, enemy. So in Vietnam, when you talk about external enemy, everyone will say, no, we have to unite and you know uh, protect our country, protect our community, our family. So we immediately compare COVID like enemy. So everyone uh, immediately, imme immediately change the mindset. It's like, okay, so now we face an uh, external enemy. It's not only a, a, a coronavirus. So we work by community and uh, the the um, the thought of people about the, the COVID is like a strong, uh, how to say, a strong um, war, you know? So everyone uh, prepare for that. So um, that is the reason why we start very quickly the, the COVID at the beginning and uh, they have uh, no room to expand in our community. And uh, there is also something very nice in the economy. You know that our province, Bình Dương province, uh, is in Vietnam. We are industrial province. So normally we should have a strong impact by COVID. But you know, the GDP growth of our province last six months is 6.8 cents, about 6.8. So it's really, really high, right? So it can be one of the highest. And what I see is um, in Vietnam, when we can stop the COVID, but you, you, you know that we cannot stop the, the economy, uh, economy crisis, then what we do is uh, the big company in Vietnam, they try to um, uh, re reorganize. So they accept more creative person, like uh, Scott already mentioned, they accept to see intrapersonal, not only for him, for them, but also intra-organization. It's a little bit like organizational intelligence. So we review everything in our company, in our organization, and we accept the crazy ideas to reform the company. Uh, for example, uh, our company is the largest in Vietnam for industrial park uh, and urban area. Uh, so we are very big uh, organization and we want to digitalized long time ago. We cannot do it. We have a too much clients and the business is turning it too quickly. So uh, during COVID, then uh, we uh, recruit some uh, young people, very creative, giving a lot of new ideas. Uh, and then we have a time and we have a room to, to do it. Then our uh, chairman say, okay, we try to do it one time forever. And then we try to do it. And uh, in six months, we totally reform our company. So now everything we sign, everything we control, KPI, everything is digitalized. So okay. it, you know, it's kind of uh, re review ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, we have only uh, less than two minutes left. So what I want each of you to to say in just few seconds, probably phrase. What is your vision? How we can contribute into development of emotional and cultural intelligence, like in, in what we do. Please, Carolyn, starting with you. Well, I would say now that we are all virtual, we all have to learn how important the energetic space is and to practice making this space intimate, which means I can see my tears in your eyes I can feel my hope in your heart. And that's a practice that we can uh, start creating ourselves and teaching others. Great, thank you. Now Liz, is your turn. Yeah, I would say uh, emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence needs to be transmitted, not just in a boutique sense, like those who sign up for workshops, but needs to be embedded in our systems, in our schools, in our healthcare, et cetera. Thank you. Absolutely. Scott, please. Thank you. Just real simple. Be extra human right now. Whatever that okay. means to you, do it a little bit more in whatever way you can. That will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Long, just and, uh, one. <laughs> like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I have only these 20 seconds to thank you all. It was very insightful. And certainly I would love to continue the conversation. But we understand that these concepts like emotional and cultural intelligence, they are tremendously important for all of us to meet the challenges of nowadays life. Thank you so much. It was a great session with you.
Thanks. We are still on. Are we still on? They showed us this this strict sign, but in any case, probably we, we are taking someone else's time at this at this point. So thank okay. you. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.